I want to tell you up front that I'm honored to be visiting Ottawa. This is my first visit, and it's uh, delightful to be uh, in the capital of Canada. And because of the topic I'm going to discuss tonight, I won't have much good to say about Canada. But I don't want you to think that I'm generalizing from this topic uh, to, to, to others. I'm delighted to be here. Um, as you know, here two years ago, the Supreme Court of Canada, in the Carter case, which John has already mentioned, ruled unanimously that laws that criminalized physician-assisted suicide violated the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. In its judgment, the court wrote the following. It is a crime in Canada to assist another person in ending her own life. As a result, people who are grievously and irremediably ill cannot seek a physician's assistance in dying and may be condemned to a life of severe and intolerable suffering. A person facing this prospect has two options. She can take her own life prematurely, often by violent or dangerous means, or she can suffer until she dies from natural causes. The choice is cruel. As you know, the Supreme Court gave the Parliament a year and then a few more months to amend the criminal code. And last summer, the Parliament did so, passing an act to permit medical assistance in dying, which assistance includes both assisted suicide and euthanasia. Now, as you would expect of the laws of an enlightened people, the Medical Assistance in Dying Act includes eligibility requirements and safeguards against abuse. A patient must be 18 years old, must give free and informed consent, and be eligible for government-funded health services. If those criteria seem a bit too broad, do not worry, there is another. A person must, quote, have a grievous and irremediable medical condition, end quote. Now you may wonder, isn't that still awfully broad? Couldn't we include under grievous and irremediable medical conditions, paraplegia after a car accident, advanced diabetes, with neuropathy, congestive heart failure, sarcoidosis, asthma? Why not severe psoriasis or even the chronic depression that leads to suicidality? Well, thankfully, this act specifies further. A person has a grievous and irremediable medical condition only if they meet all of the following criteria. A, they have a serious and incurable illness, disease, or disability. Well, that just repeats uh, the criteria we already had. They're in an advanced state of irreversible decline in capability. The illness, disease, or disability, or this cause of decline causes them enduring physical or psychological suffering that is intolerable to them and that cannot be relieved under conditions that they consider acceptable. And their death, their natural death, has become reasonably foreseeable. The act specifies no particular prognosis. Are your concerns put to rest? So in, the, in what to me, as someone observing this at a distance, uh, seemed rather astonishing. In the space of 18 months, Canada came to have what is, on the face of it, perhaps the most liberal assisted suicide and euthanasia law or policy in the world. The plain reading of this law indicates that in any competent adult who has a condition that is not clearly medically curable and which the adult experiences as causing suffering that he or she finds grievous and intolerable is eligible to be killed by a physician or to have the physician give them the means to kill himself. Now we could spend the evening exposing and uh, exposing the ironies and antinomies in the language of the Carter decision and the medical assistance in dying bill. But instead, I would turn our attention to a subtext of the movement to legalize euthanasia and assisted suicide in Canada. And that is the question of freedom of conscience for practitioners of medicine. In the Carter decision, the Supreme Court noted that multiple professional associations, including the Canadian the Canadian Medical Association and various Christian and other religiously affiliated groups had expressed concern to the court that if assisted suicide were legalized, clinicians would soon be pressured to cooperate in the practice. 
These associations ask the court to confirm that physicians and other healthcare workers cannot be compelled to provide medical aid in dying. They would, the court noted, have the court direct the legislature to provide robust protection for those who decline to support or participate in physician-assisted dying for reasons of conscience or religion. As you may know, the Supreme Court demurred, stating, in our view, nothing in the Declaration of Invalidity which we propose to issue would compel physicians to provide assistance in dying. What follows is in the hands of the physicians' colleges, parliament, and the provincial legislatures. We do underline that the charter rights of patients and physicians will need to be reconciled. In the preamble to the Medical Assistance in Dying Act, among the various whereas is, uh, that we find in such acts, we, we, we find the following. Whereas everyone has freedom of conscience and religion under Section 2 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Whereas nothing in this act affects the guarantee of freedom of conscience and religion. And whereas the government of Canada has committed to develop non-legislative le legislative measures that would respect the personal convictions of health care providers. And yet, within months of the Carter decision, in the spring of 2015, the Carter decision in, in the winter, just a few months later, more than a year before the Medical Assistance in Dying Act, the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario issued policy statement number 215, amending its professional obligations and human rights policy to articulate, quote, physicians' professional and legal obligations to provide health services without discrimination. <coughs> and in a section in that policy titled Conscience or Religious Beliefs, a rather ad hoc category, which we may discuss a little further, the college claims that, quote, where physicians choose to limit the health services they provide for reasons of conscience or religion, this may impede access to care in a manner that violates patient rights under the Charter and Code. The policy goes on to state, the college requires physicians who choose to limit the health services they provide for reasons of conscience or religion to do so in a manner that respects patient integrity, ensures access to care, protects patient safety. They conclude the only way that can be done is if the physician provides an effective referral in a timely manner. Now, what do we make of all of, all of this? I want us to particularly think about what is happening in the imaginations of the citizens of Canada and indeed, to join you in this, most of the North Atlantic nations, certainly in, including the United States. What is happening in the public imagination that leads to such policies and such reasoning that makes it plausible that someone would write such a policy uh, uh, as, we, as we are seeing? There was a time not long ago when it, when it seemed self-evident that physicians must refuse to cooperate in activities that contradict, contradict their profession to seek the patient's help. These refusals were not called conscientious refusals. They were simply the outworking of clinical judgment. In the Hippocratic Oath, of course, physicians for centuries have sworn, and pay attention with me to this language, they've sworn, I will follow that system of regimen which, according to my ability and judgment, I consider for the benefit of my patients, and abstain from whatever is deleterious and mischievous. I will give no deadly medicine to anyone if asked, nor suggest any such counsel. And in like manner, I will not give a woman a pessary to produce abortion. With purity and holiness, I will pass my life and practice my art. Into whatever houses I enter, I will go into them for the benefit of the sick and will abstain from every voluntary act of mischief and corruption. The Hippocratic Oath, as you hear, uh, reverberates with the profession to practice with integrity, refusing to cooperate in any act that is not, according to the physician's best judgment, for the benefit of the sick. The Canadian Medical Association referred to the centrality of this commitment in its factum to the Supreme Court in the Carter case, where it stated, physicians are trained to be healers, 
For most Canadian physicians, the question of assisted suicide is not a simple matter of balancing between patient autonomy and professional standards, but it goes much deeper to the very core of what it means to be a medical professional. Indeed, the, the CMA's Code of Ethics states that the core of what it means to be a medical professional includes the following fundamental responsibilities. The first of those fundamental responsibilities is consider first the well-being of the patient. The fifth is practice the art and science of medicine competently with integrity. The seventh is resist any influence or interference that could undermine your professional integrity. And the ninth is refuse to participate in or support practices that violate basic human rights. The Code of Ethics also calls physicians to recommend only those diagnostic and therapeutic services that you consider to be beneficial to your patient or to others. If a physician is to fulfill these fundamental responsibilities, he or she must practice conscientiously. That is, must practice according to her best judgment about what these responsibilities require. As with the CMA, the policies of the American Medical Association and other professional associations have long emphasized the importance of physicians practicing with integrity, using judgment, and refusing practices that contradict their profession. Moreover, to the best of my knowledge, and I could certainly, I'm not a historian, and so uh, I, I, I'm happy to be corrected here, but to my knowledge, from the first centuries of the Common Era until the present, no nation in the West has coerced physicians as a group to engage in or cooperate with practices that the physician believes contradict their commitment to the patient's health. That includes the Netherlands, it includes Belgium, Switzerland. The only exception would be the, the, the medicine of, uh, in Germany under the National Socialist Regime. Policy Statement 215 here in Ontario breaks from the centuries-old tradition by compelling physicians when a patient requests an intervention that the physician believes contradicts good practice of medicine, compels the physician to, as the college specifies in a fact sheet that they issue, take positive action to connect the patient with another physician, healthcare provider, or agency who is accessible and who does not object to the requested intervention, and to do so in a timely manner so that the patient will not experience an adverse clinical outcome. The language of Policy 215, and particularly its requirement that physicians take positive action, it's a very it's powerful moral terms, makes clear that it requires the physician to make herself complicit in the intervention that she believes is unethical. As you may already suspect, the policy, in my judgment, is outrageous uh, and unprecedented not to mention incoherent and self-contradictory in ways I'll touch on in a moment. But it's important for us, it's important for you and for me, uh, not just to, to point out uh, how outrageous it is, but to think about how the profession of medicine has come to this point. Because understanding how we got here helps us to discern how we go on in the face of such policies. The problem is not that people, in, in my judgment, the problem is not that people have forgotten or stopped taking seriously the Hippocratic Oath. An oath that, to be frank, was written in a very different time and culture than ours. Rather, the Hippocratic Oath has been held in esteem long into uh, uh, the Christian era uh, because the oath reflected a deeper shared conviction about the purpose of medicine. Namely, that medicine is for the patient's health. And the patient's health is an objective human good, which contributes to and partially constitutes human flourishing. These notions about medicine and health and human flourishing, as reasonable as they may seem to you or to me, have been losing their hold on the public's imagination for generations. So, it seems to me that public respect for the physician's right of conscience has persisted into recent years, but it has only persisted as the residue of cultural assumptions that have long since been in decline. Much as laws about marriage 
being between one man and one woman, persisted long after the underlying cultural assumptions that made sense of such laws had disintegrated. With respect to both marriage and medicine, the earlier assumptions were rooted both in convictions about the intelligibility and purposiveness of nature, of creation, as well as, frankly, the formative practices and institutions of uh, Judaism and Christianity, the culture-forming uh, uh, institutions of these traditions, particularly, of course, in our world of Christianity. Because the underlying cultural assumptions have been eroding for generations, once a tipping point was reached, our societies were ready to pivot quickly. And you've, we've seen how fast they pivoted with respect to marriage policies. And now, as well, with respect to euthanasia. It seems arbitrary in our world, and indeed bigoted, to restrict marriage to unions between one man and one woman. Similarly, it seems arbitrary and in the words of the Supreme Court here, cruel to restrict medicine to practices that preserve and restore the patient's health, objectively defined. Both these restrictions seem, in the language of the college's policy 215, to violate the patient's rights. So let me unpack my appraisal of our situation a bit more, drawing connections to the language of the college and physician, of physicians and surgeons policy before I turn to how, if this appraisal is correct, we might respond. Aristotle wrote, Now since there are many actions, arts, and sciences, their ends also are many. The end of the medical art is health, that of shipbuilding, a vessel, that of strategy, victory, that of economics, wealth. Aristotle didn't make an argument to to arrive at that observation. Rather, along with countless others through the centuries, he took these claims as starting points for philosophical reasoning, things that are known immediately by both the many and the wise. And if the end of the medical art is health, then it follows that physicians have good reason to refuse to engage in practices that injure or destroy health, or that otherwise undermine the possibility that patients whose health is threatened can entrust themselves to physicians. It makes sense to pick an obvious example for physicians to refuse to give a deadly drug to anybody or make a suggestion to that effect. Indeed, each of the things that physicians swear not to do in the Hippocratic Oath corresponds to a temptation to which physicians are susceptible or a vulnerability that if the physicians give in to it, will undermine the possibility of patients entrusting themselves to physicians. Physicians swear to give no deadly remedy, in part because, as John noted, the public knows that physicians' expertise regarding pharmaceuticals can be utilized to poison. But also because, and I know this very palpably in my own practice of palliative medicine, because physicians who care for suffering patients know that both they and their patients will at times be tempted to end the suffering by ending the sufferer. Importantly, this boundary against doing so has helped to sustain conditions in which patients can entrust themselves to physicians, to the deadly power of physicians, and under which physicians can give themselves the necessary freedom to work aggressively to relieve racking pain and other health diminishing symptoms in patients who are, who are dying. Physicians can give themselves freedom because they know, and their patients know, that as they're relieving these symptoms, they are not going to intentionally hasten the death of their patients. So under the assumption that medicine is for the patient's health, Refusing to cooperate in practices that contradict the purposes or the purpose of medicine seems essential to being a good physician. Clinical judgment, exercise conscientiously, commands esteem. What has changed? Much, of, of course, has changed. But I want to highlight three interrelated, interrelated dynamics that help, I think, to explain why the College of Physicians and Surgeons could write policy 215 as it did. 
And in response to an outcry from physicians, could lawyer up to defend the policy in the courts. First, the first change is that there is no longer consensus that medicine is for the patient's health. Deep cultural shifts over the past few centuries have resulted in widespread skepticism regarding any claims about what is good for human beings as such. That is to say, there is widespread skepticism regarding the notion that there is a given end or purpose for human beings, much less for the practice of medicine. Alasdair McIntyre described our predicament in his book, After Virtue. He noted that most of the moral terms that we use today, including terms like conscience, judgment, justice, beneficence, even ethics, have meaning only in the context of moral traditions that are now in ruins. He described a framework that arose in the classical period and reached the height of its cultural influence from the 12th century through the Enlightenment, or up until the Enlightenment. And in it, there is man as he happens to be, which contrasts with man as he would be if he realized his essential nature. And in between stands ethics, or practical reason. Providing direction about how he might move from the first description to the second, in order, in McIntyre's words, to realize our true nature and to reach our true end. In others' terms, in order that we might reach our genuine fulfillment as human beings. In this teleological framework, judgment and conscience have honored places as the faculties on which our practical reason depends in order for us to find our way, choosing the good and avoiding the evil, choosing that which is conducive to our genuine fulfillment, avoiding that which is not, in all the very complex and particular situations we encounter from one day to the next. As clinicians, using judgment to discern those actions that are conducive to the patient's health and refusing those that are not. However, over the course of modernity, this entire teleological understanding of nature in general, and of medicine in particular, has been losing its cultural authority. The framework persists in certain particular communities, perhaps uh, to some extent in this community, but the framework is no longer taken for granted in late modern Western societies. Indeed, quite the opposite. Modernity has been characterized by a progressive deconstruction of any claims to know the purposes of human beings and human activities. In his seminal essay, The End of Medicine and the Pursuit of Health, Leon Cass noted how this agnosticism leads to confusion about the purposes of medicine. He wrote there, this was by the way published in the early 1970s, it was quite prescient, it remains as relevant today as it, as it was then, if not more so. He wrote, medicine, as well as the community which supports it, appears to be perplexed regarding its purpose. Since antiquity, medicine has been regarded as the very model of an art, of a rational activity whose powers were all bent towards a clear and identifiable end. Today, though fully armed and eager to serve, the doctor finds that his target is no longer clear to him or us. Sometimes it appears to be anything at which he can take aim. At other times, it appears nowhere to be found. In fact, the very existence of a target is implicitly questioned by those who have begun to change the name of the doctor from physician to member of the helping professions. And if he were writing this today, what would he call, what would he call us? Starts with a P. <laughs> I think it's providers. Providers of health care services. So there's the first dynamic. There is no longer consensus that medicine is for the patient's health. The second and related dynamic is that the physician's conscience, and therefore clinical judgment itself, has come to be seen as an expression of arbitrary personal morality. It has nothing per se to do with good medicine. And to see how that works, just follow this logic. We've come to the point where there's no such thing as the good for human beings, as such, objectively speaking. There's no, there's a 
it's, it's, it's just part of the air we breathe that we don't believe there's such a thing in this, in this uh, culture. There's only what is good for each individual as the individual sees it from his or her subjective vantage. Much less can we say that medicine has a given purpose. Rather, the purpose of medicine has to be determined by each individual based on his or her appraisal of what is good for them. In other words, what is desirable for them, desirable to them. Therefore, it follows that the physician must retreat from the pretense of making judgments about what is good for patients, or about what is ethical. The physician who makes such judgments may think that she's discerning which actions are consistent with the purpose of medicine, but such purpose is a chimera. Worse, such language often hides the fact that behind the facade of so-called conscience and clinical judgment, the physician is unjustly imposing her religious or other personal beliefs on the patient. That's the way this, that's the way, imagine, I, I know from a long experience, that's the way people's imaginations work. And in so working, no disrespect is meant to those who happen to be religious or to have a conscientious, uh, uh, to, to, have, to object to a particular practice. The Supreme Court and the writers of Policy 215 are careful to, careful to repeat the party line. We have great respect for physicians' right of conscience and religion. So put it in the preamble. But remember, if our predicament is as McIntyre describes, the exercise of conscience and the practice of religion are no longer understood as ways that one sees through a glass dimly in order to discern how to act as one should. They're not ways that we discern the truth about ourselves and about our world. Rather, both conscience and religion, and it's, it's really telling, I think, that we start to see the two conflated as if they fit in one category in, this, in these policies and in other opinion pieces. Conscience and religion refer to ways that people individually and subjectively make meaning out of what is at root meaningless to each her own. You make your meaning one way, I make mine another. Just don't let your personal, which is to say your subjective, ultimately without basis, values or beliefs, get in the way of what is good for someone else, that is, what someone else desires. And an interesting thing happens when we think of the patient's good, when we come to think of the patient's good, as we have come, I think, culturally now, to think of the patient's good as knowable only to the patient. It comes to seem that to disagree with the patient about what is good for them is to disrespect the patient. To in some way impinge on their fundamental rights. So I think it's telling that policy 215 states that if physicians disagree with what their patients request, the physicians must respond in a way that respects patient dignity how is that? The policy says that physicians must communicate their objection directly and inform patients that the objection is due to personal and not clinical reasons. Personal reasons. Also, in the course of communicating their objection, physicians must not express moral judgments about the beliefs, lifestyle, identity, or characteristics of patients. Presumably not even about the choice the patient is making, since that is a part of the, their beliefs and life choices. So in other words, the policy suggests that the physician who objects to euthanasia must say in so many terms, I object to euthanasia, but you know, my notion that euthanasia is unethical has nothing to do with medicine. It's not a clinical objection or with capital T truth. It's only my personal way of making meaning out of my experience not to be taken too seriously. Similarly, policy 215 states that physicians must, quote, provide health services without discrimination. Here again we see, as imaginations shift, as assumptions change, the way terms change in, in, in the way their, their, their meaning is understood. In the traditional understanding of medicine, 
Physicians are required to care for patients who are sick without discriminating with respect to patients' other characteristics. In other words, without regards to patients' other non-health-related characteristics. So, for example, physicians may not refuse to care for a, a black patient out of racism or refuse to care for a gay patient because of objections to their sexual practices or even refuse to care for a criminal out of revulsion at their crimes. Just so far, physicians must practice medicine without discrimination. That's, that's, that notion has been there for a long time. Yet in the traditional understanding, physicians must, in caring for all who are sick, discriminate between those practices that are consistent with the goals of medicine and those that are not. So a physician must discriminate between respiratory illnesses for which a patient's request for antibiotics should be granted and those for which the request should be refused. In that sense, good medicine always requires discrimination. The college's policy reflects a widespread pattern of reasoning in our contemporary culture that conflates the latter form of discrimination with the former. Treating physicians' refusals to cooperate with practices such as abortion and euthanasia as de facto invidious and unlawful discrimination. That's the second dynamic. The third dynamic, which is relevant particularly to the question of assisted death, is that medicine has come to share in a generalized moral project of relieving suffering, however an individual experiences suffering. Gerald McKinney, in his essay, Bioethics, the Body, and the Legacy of Bacon, a lot of alliteration there, wrote a marvelous book called uh, To Relieve the Human Condition, which I commend to anyone who's interested in understanding the predicament of medical ethics today. But he echoed McIntyre's account of our, of our situation and foreshadowed the kind of reasoning we see in the Medical Assistance and Dying Act. McKinney writes, the ancient and medieval conception of nature as a teleological order from which a hierarchy of ends could be derived was replaced by the burgeoning conception of nature as a law-governed mechanism, susceptible to human control and neutral with regard to ends. Under characteristically Protestant moral and religious aspirations, he continues, nature was to be used for its proper twofold purpose, to glorify God rather than be served as an end in itself, and to benefit human beings. Up to this point, the roots of modern morality are in Protestant Christianity, but, he continues, radical Enlightenment thinkers such as Jeremy Bentham were able to understand their secular agenda as a superior way of affirming ordinary life and expressing benevolence. According to these, the affirmation of ordinary life meant identifying good with pleasure and evil with pain. The Protestant commitment to meeting the needs of the neighbor now became a set of obligations to prevent and remove the causes of pain and to maximize the quantity of pleasure. As Charles Taylor argues, this made it possible for the first time to put the relief of suffering and the avoidance of cruelty at the center of the social agenda. And I remind you, note that the, the language of the Supreme Court's uh, opinion, or Supreme Court's judgment um, included the notion, their, their uh, conclusion, that to not offer patients euthanasia is cruel. It allows, it leaves suffering unrelieved. So we've come to inhabit a world in which nature, including human nature, is mere mechanism. Matter in motion, as my colleague Jeffrey Bishop puts it, we still retain, culturally, for the moment, a sense that we're obligated to do good to our neighbors. But we have long since lost any standard that would tell us what the good of our neighbor entails, except insofar as the neighbor reports to us what he or she experiences as pleasure, what he or she desires, and what he or she experiences as pain, what he or she experiences as unwanted suffering. In sum, the modern imagination reduces the moral life to maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain, and in parallel, medicine's purpose has been reduced to maximizing, what do we call, what's our language for maximizing pleasure? Maximizing, starts with Q, quality of life. Maximizing quality of life and minimizing suffering. 
and we do so as the patient perceives it. The goal comes to be in McKinney's memorable phrase, to relieve the human condition of the human condition. It's only within such an imagination, it seems to me, that the writers of the college's policy could state, without awareness of the irony, three months after the Carter decision, that patients must not be exposed to adverse clinical outcomes due to a delayed referral. In the traditional way of understanding medicine, an adverse clinical outcome is one in which the patient's health is damaged or destroyed. In the modern imagination, an adverse outcome is one in which a patient's desires and wishes are not fulfilled, they're not satisfied, including the desire for a physician to put an end to the patient's health. Similarly, only within such an imagination could policymakers come to believe that what makes a, li a patient's life unworthy of life is that the patient has a condition that they experience as grievous and irremediable, and which causes suffering that is intolerable to them, and that cannot be relieved under conditions that they consider acceptable. We note again the subjectivity here. There's, uh, there's no objective standard for this. It's all dependent on what makes it good to kill a person or help them kill themselves is that the patient desires for you to do so. That ultimately is what it all devolves to. That's our predicament, as I see it. And if, if my appraisal is accurate, it, I think, forces the question, like, well, then how do we go on? How do we respond uh, to this predicament? And I'll just mention three things. First, we certainly continue uh, to make arguments. We don't give up making arguments in public, particularly to point out the contradictions and inconsistencies in the policies we've been discussing. It is still possible for people to see, well, to some extent, to see how their ideas contradict, one idea contradicts another. For example, I've already noted the way that the policy 215 conflates discrimination that good medical practice requires with discrimination that good medical practice cannot tolerate. In addition, the policy 215 sets up a false dichotomy between clinical reasons and reasons related to conscience and religion. It's true, for example, of course, that the Ten Commandments forbid murder. That does not mean that refusing to euthanize one's patient is due to personal and not clinical reasons. The policy ignores the fact that exercise of conscience, I think in a really striking way, uh, that shows just remarkable Remarkably poor thought. Uh, it ignores the fact that the exercise of conscience is essential to good medicine under any construal, quite apart from any hot button social issues. When should a physician refuse the antibiotics, antibiotics for viruses, or refuse to do surgeries that are unlikely to succeed? Presumably, when the physician believes they have good reasons, on balance, to do so. And with what capacity will a physician make such a judgment? With her conscience. In an important sense, then, practicing conscientiously is the most basic and fundamental of moral obligations. It's sort of the first principle of ethical life. Act according to your best judgment of how you ought to act. Um, the policy contradicts itself further when, further when it reminds physicians that Quote, the fiduciary nature of the physician-patient relationship requires that physicians act in their patients' best interests, and then turns right around and requires physicians to refer patients for interventions that, as best the physician can tell, contradict the patient's best interests. How can you fulfill your role as a fiduciary if you're required to do what you believe contradicts that role? So that's the first. We continue to make those arguments. And, uh, but in doing so, and here's the second, my second proposal, in doing so, we would do well to use language that people can hear. I've learned, it's taken me a long time, but I, I've learned that rhetoric really matters. Um, when a physician says, I have a right of conscience, people hear that through the filter of the assumptions we've talked about tonight. What they hear the physician saying is, I also, I, physician, also have pleasures and pains, wants and desires. These may not have anything to do with being a physician, but they're important to me. 
and I want them respected. The language of rights so, so put forward, it seems to me, leaves untroubled the assumption that the physician's refusal has nothing to do with their commitment as a physician, and instead is a request to be excused from fulfilling their professional duties, duties that they would otherwise be required to fulfill. So I think it's a very problematic rhetoric to appeal to have your conscience rights respected. Even though that's true in a very important sense, it's very hard for people to hear that and not think you're basically pitting yourself against your patient. In contrast, when a physician says, I cannot cooperate with, let's say, euthanasia, because I've, I've committed to fulfilling my profession as a physician, I will not act in a way that contradicts or destroys the patient's health. When a physician says that, then the listener's assumptions are put into question. The listener must ask the question, and I've watched this happen in many conversations, has to ask the question, huh, how is euthanasia required by or even consistent with the purposes of medicine? Once you've, once you've moved into that mode, uh, you've got a wholly different possibility of people having the insight that there's something that's contradictory going on here. Contending for medicine, of course, means getting clear in our own minds and practices what it means to make the health of the patient our goal, and that's the subject of another lecture. There's one other argument that can be heard in our day that I want to mention, and it's the argument that focuses on solidarity and trust. Insofar as physicians enjoy societal trust, it is because since Hippocrates at least, they have maintained solidarity with those who are sick and disabled. You know, setting aside some egregious examples where physicians didn't do this, and we all look back across the board, we look back on these examples and go, oh, that was terrible. Like the, the uh, Tuskegee experiments, or again, National Socialist Germany. I don't know how it was in Canada, but the US had a wild, big experiment for about a generation in, in uh, for sterilization, and, and uh, um, so there, there are these dark moments. But insofar as medicine is, is held trust, it's because they maintain solidarity with those who are sick and disabled, seeking only to heal and refusing to use their skills and powers to do harm. That's why, for example, Doctors Without Borders treats injured Taliban soldiers. It's why physicians are now probably ISIS soldiers. It's why physicians have refused to participate in capital punishment or to be active combatants, or to cooperate with torture. And it's why physicians have refused to help patients commit suicide. Yes, many patients with terminal illness fear, or with non-terminal illness, fear that they will suffer unbearably. The physician's role has been to care for them so as to help them bear up under the suffering they endure. Yes, patients often loathe the prospect of abject debility, the physician's role is to maintain solidarity with those whose health is diminished, not to imply that debility and diminished health renders a patient's life not worth living. This issue of solidarity and trust has been very visible to me in my practice of palliative medicine, particularly within the structure of hospice on the <coughs> south side of Chicago in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, the research across the United States, at least, has made clear that many Americans uh, in our uh, in the U.S., particularly among minorities and among some religious communities, distrust hospice and palliative medicine. They tell stories about loved ones who dwindled and declined slowly over time, fighting a good fight with the support and companionship of their family and friends against cancer or against some other progressive disease, until palliative medicine professionals got involved in their care, at which point the patient was put on powerful drugs, became unconscious and unresponsive, and was soon dead. These stories, uh, again, I practice palliative medicine. This is not my story, but these are, these are real stories that are part of many people's experience. And they're shared within communities, and they powerfully shape people's perceptions regarding hospice and palliative medicine, which they, many people have come to see as a seductive way of getting people dead. And for these people who, insofar as they fear that their physicians will cooperate with assistance in dying, they will go without, I watch this, met uh, many of them. They will go without the palliation 
from which I believe they could genuinely benefit, that could restore a small measure of health as activity uh, to those who are suffering terrible illnesses. So we point out contradictions and inconsistencies, making arguments. We contend for medicine, not directly, in my, my proposal, for our rights. And finally, we seek to win people over through demonstration rather than argumentation. And here's a personal wor word to Christians in the audience. Um, over the past 15 years, I've spoken to Christian clinicians all over the United States uh, and Canada who complain that they are being compelled to do this and that and say that they would like to act differently, but they cannot because of the system. And what I found, frankly, discouraging uh, is that when I ask these Christians when, how, what, did they, what happened, when did you try to do things differently? When, when, did you, when, when did you experience being disciplined by people in authority? Very few have anything to report. Very few have anything to report. So I, it seems to me that we have allowed ourselves to be rendered docile because our perception of the extent to which the secular system is going to shut us down and prevent us from practicing the way we should, our perception is actually far uh, out of proportion to the reality experienced by those who have had the courage to act. And insofar as we continue to not act out of fear, we continue to basically reify uh, the system that we experience as preventing good medicine. So in a place like Ontario, I, I dare say that 10,000 physicians have muttered bitterly about this policy 215, but how many have publicly made clear, I will not follow this policy? How many have gone you know, to the, the, legis the, the parliament and spoken to their, uh, their representatives? Who, how many have put up signage to make clear of this? So put differently, don't wait until your colleagues agree with you before you act according to your best judgment. You'll wait too long. Arguments have little power when premises are not shared, and premises are not shared today. So for the most part, you're not going to persuade people until they can see what it looks like. You're not going to persuade them that there's a better way. I encourage uh, clinicians to act peaceably but resolutely. And when people ask, what are you doing? Be prepared to give an answer. Not the answer, I'm exercising my rights, but I'm trying to fulfill my obligations as a physician. I'm trying to be a good doctor, according to my best judgment. The public appetite for forcing physicians to engage in practices that destroy health or have nothing to do with health is, I believe, is quite fragile if people will resist it. And to see people acting with conviction commands respect. Whether or not, here's the thing, whether or not we ultimately went over our colleagues and the public, we still, we must fulfill our professions. After all, that is what it means to be a good physician. 